Today, we will be discussing saving culture during World War II and beyond. It is our privilege to pass on to the coming centuries treasures of past ages, said Dwight D. Eisenhower. Our topics include Hitler and stolen culture, war and cultural icons, monuments, fine arts, and archives, including the Monuments Men, saving the Lipizzaners through Operation Cowboy, and the impact on saving art and culture today through the Monuments Men Foundation and the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield. Throughout the lecture, I would like you to consider the following questions. Were the Allied efforts to save art and culture necessary? Why is saving culture integral to freeing a nation from tyranny? How did these initial efforts impact the continuing efforts to save art and culture today? Were the Allied efforts to save art and culture necessary? As a failed artist, Adolf Hitler stole art and culture from conquered nations under the guise of protecting these items from war for his future museum at Linz, known as the De Führer Museum. On June 26, 1939, Hitler commissioned Dr. Hahn Pose to construct the new grandiose museum just prior to the start of World War II. As authorized by Hermann Göring on November 5, 1940, the Nazis stole priceless artifacts from conquered nations and peoples, particularly the Jews, for the Nazis' personal gain. So why is saving culture integral to freeing a nation from tyranny? Losing culture and art was a loss of emotional, historic, and physical identity for the targeted nations. One might say it is losing a nation's heart. Therefore, the nations fought back, and on January 5, 1943, 17 nations and the French National Committee signed a declaration condemning the Nazis' plunder of art and cultural icons. On June 23, 1943, at the behest of George Stout, the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives, the Monuments Men, was established to preserve and salvage art and historic monuments in war-torn areas. Likewise, Dwight D. Eisenhower's directives to preserve historical monuments grew out of this movement, including the one you see on the right, the May 26, 1944 D-Day Directive, which called for saving historic monuments, if at all, practicable. Now, the Monuments Men were men and women from 14 nations, roughly 345 people, including librarians, museum curators, artists, and educators, who served in Europe and Asia on the front lines in war zones and occupied areas under the directives to save, preserve, and restore art and culture to its rightful owners. They worked with locals, resistance fighters, and the military in an effort to restore a nation's artistic, historic, and cultural identities. Some monuments men include Motoko Fujishiro Huthwaite, Edward Croft Murray, James Rorimer, Captain Walter Hancock, Sherman Emery Lee, and the indomitable George Stout. Saving culture is more than just saving pieces of art. It could be Torahs stolen from throughout Europe and found in a cellar in Frankfurt, Germany. Or it could be frescoes that were found on the walls of bombed-out buildings in Palermo, Italy, where the Monuments Men worked in rubble to save and restore priceless art and cultural objects from buildings to monuments to paintings and more. From 1940 to 1941, in France, the French National Museum director Jacques Jajard, art spy Rose Valland, and German Count Franz von Wolf Metternich worked to save France's art by relying upon the Nazi bureaucracy and interpreting Hitler's orders to apply to the Nazis themselves, much to their major chagrin and unhappiness. James Rorimer later worked with Jajard and Valland to rescue train cars filled with art, eventually returning thousands of pieces of art to France. Now, saving the Lipizzaner mayors of Austria's Spanish writing school serves as an example of saving Austria's cultural heart, as the rescue defied nations, enemies, and war. Located in Vienna, Austria, the Spanish writing school is the oldest writing school in the world. They train both horse and rider in the world's highest form of dressage. The horses themselves are special, as they are the world's purest breed, the Lipizzaner, and the school today is considered an intangible cultural heritage, and one of Austria's national treasures. During World War II, Alois Podhoshsky was in charge of the Spanish Riding School and the Precious Horses. Near the end of the war, the school was placed under the protection of General George Patton's Third Army. 
Unfortunately, the Nazis shipped the Lipizzaner mares to Hostelstad in Czechoslovakia, where they were to be used in a breeding program along with other pure breeds, such as Arabian horses, to create the perfect horse fit for the Aryan race. This is where our story of one of the strangest World War II rescues begins. In April 1945, the Luftwaffe's Lieutenant Colonel Walter Halters secretly asked Patton's 3rd Army, 2nd Cavalry Group, 42nd Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron, the Ghost Riders, to save Austria's crown jewels, the Lipizzaner mares. Halters knew that hostile studs stood in the way of the approaching Soviets, and he was concerned that the horses would turn into food for the Soviet Army. With General Patton's permission, Colonel Hank Reed ordered Captain Thomas M. Stewart to Hostow to free the Allied POWs in the area and rescue the Bizonor mares. With only 350 men, Stewart reached Hostow, accepted the German surrender from Lieutenant Colonel Hubert Rodolfsky, freed the Allied POWs, and turned army trucks into horse trailers. When attacked by the Waffen SS Regiment Deutschland, Stewart enlisted help from the German POWs, former Allied POWs, and Russian Cossacks. Known as Stewart's Foreign Legion, the Motley crew successfully fought off the SS attacks. This was only one of two times during World War II when former enemies fought together. Finally, the trailers were loaded with mares in full or with newborns. American, German, and Cossack officers rode stallions and an American-style cattle drive began. Flanked by American trucks and tanks, everyone, horses, former and current POWs, Cossacks and Americans traveled the 18 miles to safety. Why? Why save horses in the midst of an ongoing war? In the words of Colonel Hank Reed, we just wanted to do something beautiful. Saving the Lipizzaner mares was indeed beautiful. All of this leads us to the present day. So how did these initial efforts impact the continuing efforts to save art and culture today. Well, the Monuments Men Foundation came into existence after the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives was disbanded in 1949. Their efforts to find and return stolen art and culture from World War II honors the legacy of the Monuments Men. This legacy is further honored through educational efforts and its current partnership with the National World War II Museum. Likewise, the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield trains American troops to protect cultural property in times of war. The committee also educates the public on cultural heritage, and they advise and assist cultural organizations during armed conflicts in accordance with the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict. I encourage you to look up these two organizations and learn about their missions, work, and efforts to save art and culture, in essence to save nations' hearts and restore the art and culture to their rightful owners. These two organizations provide some insight into how these efforts from World War II continue to impact the world today. This concludes our lecture on saving art and culture, but I want to leave you with Colonel Hank Reed's words. We wanted to do something beautiful. This simple sentence sums up the mission of saving culture. It is doing something beautiful in the face of wanton destruction.